Good. So, good morning, Jackie. Good afternoon, students. Uh, welcome to the lecture about human systems integration at NASA in the frame of our module Emerging Fields in Architecture. And uh, this year, some talks are online, some talks are present. And the talk by Jacqueline Silva Martinez is our first online lecture. I'm very grateful of having her. Thank you very much, Jackie, for taking the time. I know you're very busy. And I would like to introduce you shortly. Please add what you think is relevant for the students afterwards. Uh, Jacqueline Silva Martinez works at NASA Johnson Space Center in the Human Health and Performance Directorate, serving as the Lunar Gateway Program Human System Manager. She is originally from Peru, and Jacqueline earned two bachelor degrees from Rutgers University in the US, one in mechanical and aerospace engineering, and the other one in Spanish translation and interpretation. Jacqueline obtained a master's degree in aeronautical science with concentration in human factors aviation from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and another master's degree in aerospace engineering. Uh, with concentration in space human system integration. Jacqueline participated also in several analog missions, including human exploration research analogs at Johnson Space Center and the Mars Desert Research Analog in Utah. And what is uh, very special about Jackie is that besides her serving as lecturer on human space flight, mission operations, space architecture, engineering, she is a really powerful woman and very active in STEM and STEAM. In order to bring the topics of science, leadership and culture to the younger generation. So uh, I'm very happy to have you here, Jackie. Please uh, share your screen. Yeah. And... Thank you, Sandra, for the introduction and, and for the invitation to be here and sharing a um, little bit of what I do at, at NASA uh, with, with your students. Let me see if I can check it out. Perfect, wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, so you can see it, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, just um, uh, to add to uh, what Sandra uh, just mentioned, uh, she also asked me to provide a little bit more background on how I got where, where I am. Uh, so that will be the, the first part, but then we're going to get into some objectives uh, as part of the lecture and, um, and talk about examples for human systems integration uh, implementation. Uh, so this is pretty much what, what she said, uh, different uh, degrees and education is, is very important uh, for me. And uh, that's how our family um, uh, like educated us that uh, you know, the education is key to go uh, to different places. Uh, and I continue studying um, uh, towards the end of my PhD as well. So that's um, uh, that's something that I encourage other students to also to continue to learn. Uh, it's always important. Um, and I do a lot of uh, publications as well, put some of them here. There are more recent ones that, that we just did at uh, the International Astronautical Congress too. Uh, so also that's another uh, advice to to write the things that, you, that you're doing, that you're learning, share with others what, uh, what you're learning. Um, then uh, uh, as part of uh, when I was undergrad, uh, before a bachelor's degree, uh, I was doing some internships. Uh, so I worked within the university. We had a um, center for extreme environments. So I did some uh, research there on lunar architectures that we can have. Um, uh, the, the different structures that, that we can be doing in, on the moon. Um, and uh, then I also work with the Pratt & Whitney uh, on engine designs and Lucky Martin with a, uh, a program that, that was classified. Uh, I had some part-time jobs. I like teaching. Uh, so I also uh, did um, some, some teaching at, at night. So I went to Goodwin College teaching math, uh, physics, and uh, Spanish um, in uh, those different schools. Uh, and when I graduated, I went to, to work for Lockheed Martin uh, on the GPS-3 satellite. 
Uh, so a lot of uh, hands-on and uh, design uh, in 3D cut uh, tools. And uh, well, my parts was a, a cable that was attaching the, the bus of the satellite to um, you know, to the antennas. So I designed the antennas and, and the cables and uh, those parts were on the GPS-3 satellite. That's the, the latest uh, that we have on uh, space. Um, I, I did more within Lucky to do more assembly tests and launch operations, and then went to JPL to work on the Curiosity rover, uh, more on, on the sampling side. So we were testing everything uh, in the lab to collect the samples and, and analyze it. Uh, so as you know, Curiosity is still uh, on Mars, uh, and, uh, and it's great to see the results that it's giving us. Uh, uh, but, uh, human space flight was the, the part that, that I liked. So I moved to Johnson Space Center that's uh, here in Houston. Um, and uh, I did some rotations there with uh, the aircraft operations using my human factors so side for um, uh, the aviation. So I looked at the cockpit and how we can make improvements to the, uh, to the model uh, so that we can make those fast changes instead of waiting year, two years to to come up with something. So I developed that, that model for um, yeah, for the T-38, um, the uh, aircraft that uh, that's the one that the astronauts use before they go uh, into space um, as part of their training. Um, I also went to mission control um, to, uh, to be on the other side. Uh, Sandra mentioned that I did some uh, analog studies yeah, and uh, in one of them I was uh, the uh, the person being studied, uh, the test subject, uh, and, and then when I went to work, I was on the other side uh, planning their operations while the astronauts were being uh, tested. Uh, so that was uh, neat. And uh, went to the Human Factors and Habitability Group, uh, doing a lot of the tests for the Orion um, capsule, uh, soon to, to leave uh, Earth and Artemis 1. So we did a lot of the crew survivability tests um, for um, when uh, Orion uh, re re-enters Earth and how the crew can come out from there without um, uh, any damage, right? Or if there was design changes based on these human in the loop tests, we will uh, make those uh, recommendations. Um, so I did uh, uh, different projects in, in those places. Here's one of the projects that uh, we were doing with the astronaut Peggy uh, Whitson um, for um, crew analogous uh, uh, schedule testing. Like if they're on Mars, we're, they're not going to be able to depend on flight controllers as much. Right? A lot of those decisions, they have to make it themselves. Um, so we were testing that in, uh, on ISS. Uh, and this was the team that, that worked on that. Um, we had Mm, also, the next step tests, those were preliminary tests uh, to um, to see which of the modules or designs will be good to, to have for what now is gateway. Um, so I'm working on that program now. Uh, and I was the, uh, the planning um, expert there to uh, assign all the activities that they had to do during those uh, ground tests. Uh, and I also uh, led uh, some missions, uh, the, the pictures there, the, the right size for uh, one of the cargo missions that was taking the lithium ion batteries uh, to replace them on ISS with the HTV-8 um, uh, the, the cargo vehicle that, that we have from JAXA. Um, and uh, now I'm uh, working with the Artemis uh, program um, and looking at uh, uh, the, the full side, but um, mainly in the gateway uh, program. With this, we're going to be orbiting um, the moon and giving us a lot of opportunities to go to different parts of, of the moon and, uh, and study it more than, than what was done with Apollo. This is an old picture. Things are keep evolving, and we have you know, new partners, too. Uh, but the first two modules that are going are uh, or parts is the PPE, power and proportion element, and also the the, the HALO um, module uh, that's been done by Northrop Grumman. Like I said, this is a little bit um, old uh, picture, uh, but um, uh, we're going to be uh, having a one mission going with our humans first as part of the test, and then later on uh, we're with humans and, and then going to to the moon, coming back. So the, the whole thing has, uh, the testing has to be done in steps. 
so in, in that role, I'm uh, applying a lot of what I um, did in, in my degrees and uh, what the experience that I had with mission control and uh, systems engineering. And currently I'm the Kima system manager for Gateway. Um, and I do a lot of the systems engineering and integration uh, for human requirements. <clears throat> so I have more than, uh, well, about 400 requirements that are related to human uh, interfaces uh, and in hardware and software that a human will be interfacing with. And that's for, for the crew and also for some like control uh, teams. Um, so we have to make sure that all the modules and, and uh, providers that are working on those modules meet those um, uh, th those human requirements. So that's where it comes, the, the human systems integration uh, part as a as an important phase, right? How, how do we make sure that we're thinking of the human as we design our um, our products uh, and, and modules and spacecrafts uh, and, right, that, that we're developing? Uh, so we work still the same way as um, uh, the uh, other vehicles uh, with the uh, NASA life cycle phases uh, from pre-A to, to F, these are phases in the design reviews, uh, but HSI activity in the balance, uh, you can see it, it goes across. We need to be thinking about the human throughout the entire life cycle um, of the design. So that's what I'm, we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, I wanna start with, with this uh, picture. So um, if you don't mind, just uh, open your, your mics if you know the, the answer uh, or I'll put it in the chat and so they can help me uh, check those, those answers. Uh, but uh, this is an example of the lab where we know, um, and I wanted to know what what do you think this looks like? The the one in the red circle. What does it look like to you? Like a handlebar. Yeah, exactly, and that's uh, exactly how the crew used it, like a handlebar and. Uh, although it was a vacuum line, uh, that's <laughs> that, that's the first thing that, that we will do. But because they they had some issues um, in that that line could have had a leak, uh, we had to send the crew uh, something to uh, for them to put on top so that they don't use it for that purpose. Uh, and, and that's simple thing, right? That nobody really thought like it was gonna affect, but um, that's uh, one part of where HSI enables to to encounter design induced and, and assembly errors. Uh, and, and before they go to operations, in this case, we caught it when it was already in space. It was a little bit too late. Uh, but you see on this side, uh, the crew is still at it <laughs> their taped uh, part to, to show the uh, handle. Um, another example here for why HSI is important, this is the carbon dioxide removal assembly. And um, uh, maybe again, another question, what do you see here? That's the, the crew are, are playing with this, but this is something that they move out of the racks. And any issues that you see here, maybe what makes it wrong? Uh, let me see the, the chat. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, a lot of uh, bulky uh, instrument, right? The, the crew has to take a lot of photos as they pull it apart to, to make sure that uh, they, they can put it back together. Um, the, as you can see, the hydroflow uh, connectors are challenging to work with. Um, they are oops, sorry. <laughs> they are all the same color. So um, even when they have to put it together, uh, that's why they use the, the photos. Uh, but those are things that also the design, uh, the designers uh, can be preventing for if they're thinking about the, the human that's going to be operating it, right? Uh, so um, the, there are certain parts that are difficult to access, so that have, that's why they have to pull it all out. So with, with these days, uh, the crew spends a lot of time doing that. Uh, routine maintenance and duration, so it's about three hours plus the other four hours to go and uh, repairs, 10 hours. And th this has been improved over years, um, but 
um, you know, well, we have to make sure that the new designs are accounted for for these things too. Uh, how how ease uh, of operations we are uh, putting in, into the assembly, not just uh, thinking how the, the crew is going to fix things uh, on well, on operations, but um, the, the the key tenet of HSI is to integrate those human capabilities and limitations uh, early on. Uh, one more example here for operational uh, concerns: Robonat, state of the art. Uh, uh, rather that uh, that we sent to ISS, uh, the idea was for it to help um, the astronauts to to do a lot of the activities that they probably were taking too much time on. Uh, but as you can see, if it's uh, a lot of the ISS and with all the cabling that we have around, uh, it's hard to even move around. And um, the crew was spending a lot more time to to get it assembled and, and making sure that it doesn't bump into different areas. So at the end, it wasn't really helping too much, right? And we had to move the cameras also to, to make sure that we still have an angle on, a good um, angle on, on the Robonat. And, and the design originally was um, used for, um, you know, for EVA, for the legs, uh, so for the extravehicular activities, but then uh, they decided to just use it uh, yeah, for uh, inside vehicle activities. And uh, that it is not just a, a matter of saying, hey, we're going to use it for something else, right? It needs to come from the design phase of what applications you're going to be doing. Uh, so all that to, to tell you that uh, HSI is, is necessary from the beginning, right? And that we have to be accounting for those uh, human capabilities and limitations. Uh, but that is our, the objectives for, for this lecture. And just three of them, uh, you'll be able to define what HSI uh, is within the context of NASA's life cycle phases. Uh, you'll be able to interpret uh, what is system of systems capability and how it influences HSI. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to explain the uh, six NASA HSI domains uh, using examples of expertise. Um, so any questions before we get to the first objective here? Let's see now. We'll be moving to the first one. Uh, what is HSI? I'll give you some examples. Uh, of course, there are definitions, long definitions that are in different uh, requirement documents. Um, this one is what we had, um, and this keeps evolving, right, in a way that we're trying to convey better what uh, HSI is, um, interdisciplinary technical and management process, uh, integrating the human system considerations, and reducing total system life cycle costs. Um, so the, these are some guidelines. You can find all these documents uh, online. They are open to the public. Um, if you want to have more um, definitions and uh, how how to implement HSI, but the NASA HSI handbook was um, uh, redone. It started with a practitioner's guide uh, for um, for five years that, that we had it, and last year uh, we revamped it and added more more content. So this is very recent. Um, the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook also talks about HSI, and now it's required by uh, by many programs, especially human spaceflight, uh, with these uh, NASA procedural requirement documents. Um, so, and just to to highlight some of the parts of that definition, right? That the things that that should be sticking um, on your heads for for HSI is an interdisciplinary technical management process or processes. Um, it's uh, sometimes that they confuse it with uh, human factors and it, uh, human factors is part of it, uh, but this is uh, looking at the whole process. How do we actually make sure that there is uh, conversations going through different technical groups, that there are processes in place to put the, the humans um, in mind while the design is being done, uh, all, all that and that part, the integration piece. Um, and um, the this goes along with that integrated human considerations. We have to account for both, right? The capabilities, we are capable of doing a lot of things and, and very adaptable, uh, but also we have limitations. And sometimes, um, especially with crew, sometimes we don't get to recognize that we have those limitations. We think we're, we can do everything, but uh, there, there are limitations that we, uh, as the engineers helping them, uh, have to account for. 
and uh, it applies across all systems, so system of systems, and reduces total cycle system life cycle costs. Uh, the, the one example that I showed you at the beginning, right, it, it was very simple, uh, something that looked like a handle, you're trying to cover it. That requires some cost because you have to send, prepare procedures, send materials, uh, and, and, and the crew is spending time to cover an error that could have been prevented early on and, and the, the cost would have been less. Okay, so key takeaways. Uh, in the, the one is that it just enables better error management. We cannot prevent errors from happening. Uh, they, they will happen, but at least we have to better manage it um, early on and, and fly safely. Um, this part talks about the those life cycle phases. Uh, I like to make the comparison with something that if you haven't seen this um, this before, uh, we can start from the commercial part. Well, if you think of a uh, of uh, automobile, right? And um, they, they go through the same kind of steps, they call it differently, uh, but they have to be looking at the, the planning, concept development, and design development, production, sales and distribution, utilization, maintenance and support, and retirement. So that, that's good, the, the phases that a, a car goes through. And they have design reviews as well, critical design reviews, and they, these are called differently. Um, but they have some human systems integration like activities and they start at different phases. But the same thing, uh, the Department of Defense uh, has also those different design reviews. They also uh, follow HSI activities. Uh, and then at NASA, we do the same. It has a little bit more phases um, and more design reviews, as you can see. But um, HSI, again, is across the life cycle of that. Uh, and this is not uh, just uh, for NASA, you know, other federal agencies were doing HSI in a formal way even uh, before NASA. Um, and, and this is uh, documented in uh, other in IEEE and in COSI documentations. Um, so that this is the part that we're gonna be talking about, just um, highlighting uh, the NASA part in HSI, uh, so some examples, right, are the conceptualization and architecture uh, parts that will be helping out with the concept of operations for the mission uh, or the program, uh, those requirements that have to do with the humans, uh, maybe doing some prototypes early on and in assessments. Uh, then we move to cross-cutting and management, um, there's some trade study reports and um, the program pros for the HSI plan. Uh, some risks that I identify uh, in uh, during production and operations. We're looking at human in the loop testing, and, and those are done early on to uh, to support the the operation, right? And monitoring human performance. So just some examples of what that entails. Mm -hmm. And if you have a question, feel free to to speak up. Uh, here, just aligning with these uh, phases uh, that that we have to follow uh, for standards uh, for NASA. Uh, those are seen here in the first column. Uh, these are other activities, products, and risk mitigations. Um, at the beginning, we'll be looking at those con ops uh, during phase A, and this is what we done also for gateway. Um, identifying, developing a, a plan for human systems integration. How are we planning to actually do this, right? And that, that planning is very important. And, and that planning keeps the evolving too. Sometimes we, we don't have everything up front. We don't know the whole design. We have to keep um, adding to that. So that's why you see updates later on. And the corners change some requirements. So we need to be flexible also what a type of... Um, uh, maybe uh, different solutions that uh, the providers are bringing uh, in in updating and uh, making sure that they understand the requirements. Uh, all that is happening throughout the different phases. Um, and a lot of this is done also to support a lot of the products from HSI are done to support the human rating uh, certification. Uh, so before they fly, each mission has to improve and provide a package that they are ready for for flight. 
um, in, in that's done by another group, but they use a lot of the products from, from HSI to, to show that. Uh, so that, that was for the uh, first objective. Um, now you know what is HSI and, and can define it. And now we're going to move into uh, interpreting that from. Yep. Can I ask you a question? Because I just realized that. Uh, um, can you maybe also say two sentences about the Lunar Gateway? Because who of you that are here know what the Lunar Gateway project is? It's not none, but a few of you, right? Who knows what the Lunar Gateway is? Heard of it? Have, has anybody heard of the Lunar Gateway? Yes, Anna, you're right. Mm -hmm. Not on the moon, uh, but... Around the moon, yeah. Anybody mm -hmm. else? I know some of you know. Yes, wonderful, Julian. Basically, the ISS around uh, the moon. Milumir, yes. So, uh, anybody knows why we need the gateway? I think it was like the first step of. Uh of settling on Mars. So to train the astronauts and uh, to get uh, the whole logistics together of how to get things up in space and then to the to the place itself and also for communication, I assume. What do you think, Jackie? Is this the right answer? Yes, yes, and, and uh, I tried to share that at the beginning too uh, with, with Gateway already in the moon. Um, it is a space station and it is done with international support. Uh, but I don't know why uh, people don't, don't like to call it uh, ISS around the moon because it, obviously we have an uh, international space station already around Earth or orbiting Earth. And uh, for uh, for Gateway, uh, we're going with uh, commercial uh, providers and um, and international partners. So it, it's a great effort to uh, to try to go to different places, uh, uh, different sides of the moon, uh, in in a sustainable manner. Right? We can refuel there, and the station is going to stay there, and then we can uh, go to, uh, to to different parts. So uh, that's uh, that's the beauty of Gateway. It's smaller than than ISS. Uh, it can keep growing as we get more more partners. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, right now, the um, the plan is not to um, to have uh, continuous presence, uh, human presence in, in the station. It's going to be about a month per year, um, but uh, we'll see as, as things and, and the missions develop. Uh, but uh, we're accounting for that human presence with the different requirements that, that I was talking to you about. And those are good uh, answers. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and I'll be providing some example, specific examples for, for Gateway, but we're following a lot of these for different programs and, and for Gateway in, in itself. Thank you. Um, so for the um, uh, second one here, uh, the to interpret how system of systems capability influences HSI, we have uh, system of systems engineering. Uh, probably heard of that now with the complex systems that we have there is nothing uh, just uh, one system right that everything is uh, uh, it goes across different systems um and uh, just like a total system of system of systems is equals to mission here we have human and hardware and software we have to be thinking of, of those three uh, at the same time uh, there's even a formula for um, looking at the total performance of equipment um times software and hardware times human performance uh, but we we know i think that uh, as being the humans we introduce a lot more um more risk to to any missions so we consider the critical system of all safety critical system now uh, hsi from a systems engineering perspective um now uh, 
we're, we're still transitioning to, to the, this other side, but in the traditional system view, uh, we always thought about like, we're gonna meet the hardware requirements, so it, it's a good design. We're gonna meet the software requirements, so it's a good design. Uh, and, and like I said, the human is involved in different aspects. So we have to be translating to this thinking of system of systems. And for that is what we call the paradigm shift, um, right? Looking at the capability. Uh, if I make a change in one of all of the components or, or things for the hardware or software, how can how is it going to affect the rest of them? Uh, so that's uh, the the thinking of you know, human hardware and software is that sort of capability uh, in in a specific environment. Um, so human in HSI refers to all personnel um, involving a given system. Uh, now, um, th this will change per program. For Gateway, for example, uh, uh, we focus on, on the crew uh, and, and some flight personnel. Uh, but um, uh, the HSI and the uh, reality is uh, involving all, all personnel, right? The manufacturers, the, the, those that are doing the testing, the engineers. Uh, everyone should be accounted for because so even though we're not in space, we have to be thinking of um, how is this going to be our, uh, let's say, the, uh, the the integration of a system. If we're going to have the right tools, the right environment to, to run those tests, even before we send things to space. Um, the, the system system capabilities, uh, there's a lot of things here. I just wanted to point out three three main things. Uh, is uh, the focus shifting to work capability rather than on a system. Like, what can I do if something else changes? Uh, and focus shifting toward design for affordability rather than design for performance. Many times if you're into project management, we have to meet uh, cost schedule and technical performance. Uh, but a lot of that is driven by the first two costs in the schedule. Just to get it done, we're going to make some decisions and, and it's going to stay there when we could have probably spent more time and uh, optimizing our system or um, making sure that that capability can be used for something else. So that that, that, that part can, needs to be adjusted. And also the top-down approach where capability is measured by how the system or system operates when integrated. Uh, it's not about uh, optimizing just one system and say, yeah, this is the best I can do with, um, I don't know, a, a knob. Um, and then um, the, the other part, the, the hatch, for example, is being developed and uh, how we can make it better. Uh, that it cannot go that way. It needs to be an integrated part. Like when when we are putting everything together, how the the system of system is gonna perform uh, together. Mm, and that's represented in this uh, graph to where we have HSI in the middle. But the same processes happen. Uh, this is not not adding anything else or. Um, any cost. Sometimes that's what uh, people will think, well, this is going to add cost to, to my thesis. In reality, it's going to um, decrease the cost because you're anticipating problems early on during the design. But we still need to do systems engineering integration, uh, project products um, that are being developed. There's still program management and test and evaluation. And this is just showing how HSI overlaps with all those uh, different things that uh, usually our offices or established groups already in, in, in companies or uh, in, in projects. Um, and again, emphasizing here in the, in the bottom, the system optimization happens in an integrated fashion, right? and not components that have been independently optimized. Uh, we developed the, in this uh, interaction uh, a graph too. It comes from the handbook for um, uh, human centered design. Uh, um, but um, we'll, I added a few more things to, to make it clear that that cycle of, of, uh, of the steps. Um, human centered design is uh, actually an iterative process. And we start with that planning again, right? Um, for human systems integration. Um, and uh, developing that, that plan, if it's going to be part of what and the responsibilities. Um, and then we'll start developing mission scenarios, uh, doing task analysis, uh, integrated operation scenarios, 
uh, and start testing them. See how it is going to be done. Uh, some of that can be virtual at the beginning as uh, there are developmental studies uh, and then you want to look at them in a physical setting. Um, maybe those are called mockups that, that we start doing uh, and refining that design. Right? We might find issues or things that don't go as expected and we might have to go back and, and reassess uh, the, the understanding of the requirement or the requirement itself, or uh, or the design needs to, to be changed to, to meet the, the requirement. And then that there's evaluation and all that. So again, uh, iterative at one point, we're gonna have to stop because we have to deliver the product, uh, but uh, we want to uh, make it as, uh, uh, as, as best as possible. That's gonna account for those uh, human capabilities and limitations that we've been discussing about. So testing is critical. Uh, in All right, questions before I move to the next session. Okay, uh, so for uh, the last one here, uh, on the objectives, uh, I'm going to explain what the six NASA HSI domains are. Um, now, um, this, uh, I want to clarify that uh, the, the domains change per industry. Um, if you look at the uh, Department of Defense, they have eight uh, domains. Uh, other the Air Force, I think they also have uh, six or or eight. I can't remember <laughs> many of them. Um, in other countries, also might come up with with different things. So, depending on the mission, I think, and our objectives, right? This number will change, and and what the um, the emphasis is uh, will change. So for NASA, uh, what we divided into is uh, six different domains. Um, now, HSI is not done by one person, not by one group. It's done by uh, many people because, uh, again, it's an uh, integrated in, uh, technical and, and management process. So we need expertise from different places. Uh, and now we'll start here with human factors. Uh, we're uh, looking at those human limitations and capabilities uh, for operations, it's designing for flight and ground human objectives and constraints. Uh, this includes autonomy and automation. Uh, even when uh, we say that uh, the vehicle is going to uh, automatically, it's going to be uh, automatic and then do a lot of the things uh, on its own, there's a human writing that code that will need to be. Um, you know, uh, looking up after that, if there are any issues, we need to update it and, and control that from, from some way. Uh, so we're looking at that in that domain. Uh, we have safety, uh, obviously, for everything that uh, we do, minimize the risks as much as possible. Um, in the habitability and environment, we ensure that the design supports human health and performance. Uh, so all the, the living conditions have to be there. So those are uh, primary thing, and we thought about a lot about this um, uh, in the space architecture, right? That now it is not just to send them in a space lab and, uh, and see how they adapt to, <laughs> to the new environment, but how do we make it uh, for, for, how do we make the design suitable for, for that adaptation to be better uh, when, when in, uh, and for the crew members to be efficient in their, uh, in their work. Uh, maintainability and supportability, you have to decide to simplify and optimize uh, those, those resources. Just like the example that I show with uh, uh, the big bulky uh, Sidra that seemed to change it into different parts and the crew needed to take uh, so many photos of it. Um, that's um, that's something that, that you want to optimize during the design even before you, you fly it. Right? You think about how, how much time the crew might need to, to maintain your product. And if it's going to take too long, then that's your Q2 to, to be thinking about a different way to do it. Uh, this is um, uh, very important for us for Gateway because like I mentioned, it's not going to be a man the, the whole year, uh, just a, a month or maybe a little longer. Um, and, and we cannot um, just uh, trust that the, the human is going to go and, and repair that. That will be the time that they will be spending there just doing a lot of repairs instead of doing scientific um, uh, experiments. Right? Uh, and, and training uh, also something that needs to be accounted for from, from the design. Right. Um, maybe as, a, as an expert, uh, I know what my, my design does and 
um, in, in how is it going to be operated, but uh, I cannot mm, uh, just uh, rely on, on, on procedures or, or thinking that the crew is going to remember everything uh, when, when they are in space to, to do a lot of these uh, repairs or, uh, or to do my experiment in space or to make it as easy as possible to follow and to train and that they don't spend as much time uh, trying to recall information. Uh, so these are uh, the six areas that, that we have, and, and we have expertise in different uh, places uh, for Gateway. Um, they are in different directories within Johnson Space Center. We have um, uh, about four uh, directories that have their, their main uh, expertise uh, to, to address different areas here. But we also rely on our module providers to have that expertise um, and, uh, and also be meeting these uh, six domains and have that integration uh, across. Um, with NASA, we also have other centers that might be providing that expertise uh, and as well as our international partners. Uh, so uh, that's how the, the integration happens, right? We all have to be thinking about these uh, especially the crew uh, type of missions uh, that the human is the, uh, the main aspect there. Any questions here? Okay. Uh, we have some questions from Julia, please. So I was wondering if there are any examples for interventions of the HSI for psychological health of astronauts. So you were talking about these handles, which you shouldn't be able to grab, but I wondered if there's like any psychological factors, like maybe lightning or stuff like this. So if you're also working in this area, so if you're more like on a mechanical side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are um, the human factors team will be looking at the, uh, the psychological uh, effects too. Uh, for design itself, there are some requirements that, that say that they're not you know, going to damage you know, psychologically the, uh, the astronaut. But um, uh, if you're talking about the design phase, during operations, uh, uh, there is a continuous uh, monitoring of um, uh, of the astronauts' health. So we have uh, doctors calling them every um, month, or every week or so. It might change for how Gateway operates. We don't have those details yet, um, and and also they get to speak with their family members. So that that always adds up to um, monitoring if they're feeling well or not, and uh, how maybe the frustration of some of these. Um, designs might be affecting their, their workload, right? Um, uh, so th that's what part of the products of HSI products too, to prevent that from happening during operations. Uh, we require a workload analysis uh, that's done by, by the module uh, in how each of the things that they're going to be doing um, might be affecting to that. So that's where the analysis goes into looking at all those different aspects. Good question. I see another one. Uh, what are the advantages to have us stop on the moon uh, on the way to Mars? Again, uh, refueling purposes and 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 less uh, delta B that that will be required to just come off from all the way from Earth, right? Go, going if it's the gravity. So by having it um by the moon, it's uh, an easier way to to get to Mars. Mm, that's all I see for now. Okay, so I'll keep moving here with uh, just more examples and definitions for uh, these domains. And so for the first one that we were talking about human factors, uh, and you'll have this available to can go into more details, but uh, here's like the optimization of the human well-being and overall system safety. Uh, human factors is going to be looking at, at the whole integration of, of the humans so if they can. Uh, it goes from a usability um, uh, type of test to uh, situational awareness, work, workload, like I was mentioning, to human in the loop uh, evaluations. Uh, so they're, they're looking at how if, if the crew can, uh, can reach everything in a safe manner, uh, if they're not going to trick with some of the things, if they can um, 
operate with different lighting conditions, um, and, uh, so that that integrated part. So th there's different examples, I'm just mentioning some of them. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that we start uh, with a, a lot of the, even to meet some requirements is uh, uh, the, the need for task analysis. So what do we expect the, the crew members to be doing uh, and what are the things that they need for that? So the resources, can they do it? Is it gonna be risky? Is it gonna be catastrophic? Um, yeah, if it's a, a critical task or catastrophic task, um, well, what are the methods and measures uh, put in to, to prevent it to, to become catastrophic? Um, so all those things are assessed there. Uh, so uh, again, it, they, this needs to be discussed with all the, the system uh, leads and, and managers, right? system engineers from the different um, uh, hardware and software to be able to analyze that. Um, and we look at the anthropometry and, and biomechanics, uh, the architecture part of it. And so uh, a lot of the architecture uh, knowledge and, and the understanding goes into uh, into these tests. So, uh, to operations uh, here, the, um, this is uh, uh, looking at into the preparation and flight operations itself. So uh, if you have mission control uh, and while crew is in uh, orbit, what do we have to do uh, to drive that uh, system design in a safe manner? Um, as I mentioned, automation and autonomy. Uh, and some examples for that are uh, the, the fly operations, the crew time, accounting for how the design is going to take less time uh, to do that. Uh, for the International Space Station, for example, we thought that at some point we will spend most of the time just doing science, but we're still maintaining, doing a lot of, the crew spends a lot of time just doing a lot of maintenance to, to the spacecraft. Um, and, and some of that is because we didn't account for that early on. Uh, and some of that is because the, the station is also aging, right? And it needs this kind of maintenance. Um, and going into that part of maintainability and supportability, uh, those are the things that we should be uh, thinking about during the design phase. Uh, are essential for because of the limited time that we have, the distance to, to space missions, and as we go to deep space, that's going to be even more uh, more critical. Um, so you know, how much time we're spending and doing housekeeping activities, in-flight maintenance, uh, and remembering all that through, through training. Logistics is a big one. Uh, right? uh, that's another one that uh, sometimes is left for last. Uh, thinking that, oh, we're not going to have that, that many things that we don't need. And, um, and then we end up with a lot of extra uh, things in, in the station. And um, a lot of the vehicles that we send when they have to be taking a lot of trash and, and burning space because uh, and it's uh, occupying a lot of space in, in the International Space Station. Uh, so we have to account for, for those things also early on. Uh, for Gateway, we're uh, developing a logistics module that's going to be taking a lot of logistics. Uh, and uh, and then after a certain uh, time, it can be uh, sent away with some other trash. More examples here. We have a uh, habitability environment. Uh, we're looking at those uh, E-class systems, uh, environmental control um, systems, radiation health, toxicology, nutrition, acoustics, architecture, again, appears um, uh, there, um, medical concerns, uh, lighting conditions uh, that might affect them. And so that goes back to your question, Julian, that uh, we'll be looking at. Uh, at, at those different things. And there are requirements uh, in place for, for each of these. Uh, for some, for many of them, you know, we already have uh, like, uh, a range of like what is the, the limit and uh, what what to, uh, the materials that they're going to select or um, um, the, the structures that they're going to select, they have to meet those, those criteria. Otherwise, it becomes a risk to, to the human health. Mm, then for safety, uh, there, there are reliability um, uh, type of analysis done, safety analysis, quality assurance, uh, hazard analysis. Uh, there are a lot of these products also talk back to, to the task analysis uh, to, 
to see, like, analyze one is done from the bottom up approach and another one from the top down. And, and that way we can see different errors or possible issues that, that can happen and, and produce a human error um, and, and control those before they, they go to space. Uh, and, and training again uh, with the instructional design, onboard training uh, and having the facility development in place. Um, a lot of the markups that we will use, for example, for the human in the loop test could become uh, these training facilities. Uh, that's how we have it for ISS. A lot of those modules are, are being on, on our uh, building night uh, here at uh, just the Space Center where the crew goes and, and practice and, and train there before they fly. Okay, and uh, just um, to wrap up here, uh, these are some things that, that we tend to hear uh, from the community still. Uh, that they say, well, I don't need to use uh, human systems integration because I'll just train the operator on the specifics and they will remember. <laughs> And, uh, and you know that that's not true even for us, right? We uh, practice for a test uh, or um, are studying for a test. Uh, we might not remember everything during the test itself. We can do our best, but uh, the recall uh, of information can change. <clears throat> um, I don't need to do or use HSI because it's clear to me. Right, as an expert of our design, of our hardware or software, it might be clear to us, but it might not be clear for those users who are going to be applying it. So we need to make sure that it's easy to use and also our procedures are easy to use. That goes along with our procedures as well. Uh, I don't need to use HSI. I'll rely on the crew to do onboard maintenance. Uh, this is a, a big one. And that's why I, I said a lot of... Uh, examples of how this is uh, done for ISS, right? And a lot of those designs, um, they, they said like, yeah, that's going to be fixed later. We'll, we'll work around it. There's going to be a workaround during operations. I uh, cannot rely on that because uh, it might, it's not going to be sustainable in that manner. Uh, and then this is something I, I tell everyone uh, that we need to be asking those questions to assess operation costs early on. Um, so even as we, if you're developing something or designing, think about that later uh, phase. This is going to be in operations. What's going to happen? If I make this decision now, how is that contributing to higher costs during operations? Um, and that, that will help with the uh, mentality on, on our decisions uh, during the design phase. Uh, with that, some conclusions here. So we talk about uh, HSI as a process in uh, which human capabilities and limitations are effectively and affordably integrated with the system design and development. Um, and HSI ensures the design of a mission project or product uh, systems are centered on the needs, capabilities, and limitations of the human. Uh, this is the human-centered design that I was talking to you about. Um, and then HSI enables the integration of human considerations across the life cycle. I show you that um, big graph of the different life cycle um, phases and the milestones that, that we have to meet, uh, but HSI is in each of, of those areas. Uh, and uh, I'll stop here for some questions and we'll do some review afterwards. I have a question. Um, you showed a sheet about the um, life circle, and at the end it was, um, you said, retirement. And my question is, what happens with the um, satellites or um, stations? What, what happens with the cr construction after it, it is used? Are you taking it back on Earth, or will it stay there? Yes, yeah, good question, uh, Karina. Uh, mm, it depends. Um, most of them are, you know, the, mm, the, the products or satellites are, are staying uh, till the end, in space till the end of their life. Uh, some space girls, like the ones that are taking our astronauts to, to mm, the International Space Station and coming back, they, they get to come back with, with the uh, safe crew and, and some uh, experiments and um, 
in, um, some of the results in that analysis that we did to back to Earth. Uh, but um, in general, I will say there is a lot of um, um, a lot of that area is uh, it goes into the space policy part. Uh, you're touching on, on a, a big issue now that um, all the different countries participating in space have been sending stuff, but because the, these um, uh, treaties have been, have been being, uh, space treaties have been being as uh, explicit as possible, they, they didn't account into that. Um, they didn't take into account that sustainability part. I'm like, what do we do with our space stuff once it's, it's in space? So a lot of them are floating around. Um, at some point, they the orbit. Uh, so mm, there is a, a institution that knows where the different satellites are, uh, right in uh, in Leo, Mio, and, and Geo, uh, and um, uh, and then they when the, they have to have enough fuel to the orbit and, and go uh, out to space, and they can disintegrate at some point. Uh, it, it does have a risk of maybe mm, hitting something else, uh, but uh, luckily it didn't happen. Um, but we're creating a lot of uh, debris in space, uh, unfortunately. And uh, now there is a lot more push for the, the new designs to be thinking about that. What are you going to do with that without uh, causing a lot of other risks? And so yeah, that's uh, a good question. And uh, I'll more on some challenge that we have to be thinking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the pretty nice uh, presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. I just has the I just had the question about the stop on the moon. Wouldn't it be easier uh, to first get into an orbit around the um, Earth and then uh, do a transfer directly to Mars? Doesn't it add a bit more of complexity and uh, maybe a chance to risk? Yeah, you, you can say that uh, they were trying different things to be able to be flexible with the type of solutions that we provide. Uh, the main goal is to get there, right, <laughs> to the to to the to Mars and and see different options that that will get us there, uh, proving the the uh, our capabilities as humans being able to do that to operate a spacecraft to uh, or a station in this case and. Uh, and all those different things are, are important. And, and the moon is what's uh, closer to us. Uh, if there is an issue, we can quickly come back. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of that proving the, the waters and testing the, the waters before we, we go further. Um, so yeah, I mean, your idea uh, is something that has been tested as well, but um, it, it might take longer. So it, it depends on, on who's behind it, who's financing that, our governments, right, or in the space policies that uh, that countries do, uh, so a lot of that plays into uh, into that too, so not, not just the the technical part, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, a question from Nicholas. Companies like SpaceX, uh, or uh, Nicholas, if you want to ask it. Uh, sure. Um, companies like, like SpaceX and Blue Origin seem to have very short time horizons and goals for going to the moon or Mars. It seems much tighter and shorter than what NASA is presenting oftentimes. So I was wondering, do they even have time to implement um, HSI, like the steps you were talking about, in these time horizons? Or are they simply basically winging it and leaving their research part up to NASA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and this comes with uh, some uh, confusion sometimes that uh, the the uh, the public uh, what, what they hear is that maybe it's NASA uh, against SpaceX, right? Or it's a race. So who who gets there first? Uh, and it's really not that way. It's a collaboration effort. SpaceX is getting a lot of the uh, contracts that, that NASA is putting out there for them to develop their uh, design and make it better to, to get to the moon, to, to get to Mars. They're learning a lot of the things that, uh, that NASA has experienced on, um, um, besides the, the budget that they get to, <laughs> to do their missions. Um, 
And, and in that part, uh, as part of our guidance and, uh, and the value that we provide, uh, we are also introducing these uh, HSI concepts. Uh, they have to be meeting those uh, uh, HSI requirements. Uh, and they've been uh, being flexible and, and open to, to learning about those. Um, it might take a little bit more time uh, to you know, have those conversations, the understanding, um, but the good thing uh, about them is that they listen and they put it into, into action. So we say, yes, you need to do more human in the loop um, uh, you know, um, uh, tests uh, to, to show that your concept is really uh, functioning. Uh, then they, they go and build their mock-up and they do it. <laughs> so um, it's important to have that, that conversation and that, um, that, that customer and uh, uh, relationship that when when we're saying something, they listen and they pay attention and they do it. Mm -hmm. Others might not be as uh, as open to that. Uh, there's a lot of the fixed contract um, part of like, this is what you told me at the beginning, it must stay this way, right? To follow a requirement. Uh, in, um, as we learn new things, because this iterative process, we might not have had at, the, at, at front. Uh, so it's also on the side of the commercial provider to be open, to be flexible to, to that change. Uh, and, and some of them um, are, are good at that, like I mentioned, and others are still learning, uh, including us, right? Uh, NAS is a government uh, function, so there's a lot of bureaucracy as well, but uh, we're also uh, trying to be flexible with uh, the different processes that we had in place. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, Sandra says, how many architects uh, are working in your department right now at NASA? Um, so um, I have a space architect with a degree of a space architect, about three or four that I'm, uh, well, they, they moved to another one. Let's say a handful, five or, or so uh, at NASA. But now we have also contractors that work uh, for these different uh, programs uh, throughout Artemis. We have Human Landing System, we have uh, Gateway and others. So they come through the contractor side and, uh, and, and there has been more um, or in, uh, um, acquisition or uh, the more interest from architects and from those companies to hire architects into and that arena. I don't have the numbers, but um, I know them from the Space Architecture Technical Committee that we have through AIAA, American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics. Uh, and, and that's growing. The, the community is growing and, and it's good because uh, architects bring that, that human part that uh, many times the engineers um, didn't are not able to provide because we're more used to like hardware and software. We need the requirements, that's it, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, but we needed a human piece, and uh, that's uh, that's noted with this increase of um, space architecture interest. Let's see the other. Uh, Julian, you want to? Yeah, Julian, you can go. So I was wondering if it's maybe a goal to have the new space station have rather look uh, more clean than the ISS, because in the ISS, if you see pictures. <clears throat> you always have like a lot of cables and switches and narrow passages so maybe i was wondering if it would be like um, a good idea to have it look less cluttered so you can have like more clean optic but maybe it isn't even possible because there's so much stuff which needs to fit in but yeah that is what i was wondering about yes i have a question julia that that's uh, exactly what we're trying to to prevent that um the okay, gateway goes to the same thing as um uh, as I says, and, and not because it was bad, but because it wasn't thought of um early on, right? To to know that um, storage uh, is needed, that um uh, that that trash uh, is needed for that logistics uh, maintenance, uh things that were thought of like okay, we'll deal with that later. Um, and, and now we have requirements in place that says um, your hardware software has to be accounted for those uh, maintenance levels or what we're going to do after after it's used, where is it going to go? Uh, and it's challenging because um, uh, these vehicles, it's not just gateway that's going to be, uh, you know, so the responsibility that's going to have the responsibility to, to be taking care of that, uh, that, that cloud or the logistics and anything that comes up from that. Uh, but we have other vehicles, right? Orion is going to be taking humans, so they're going to be transferring things from there to Gateway. Then when, whenever the human landing system is going to go from 
the gateway extension to the moon, uh, the astronauts are going to be bringing stuff from the moon. And uh, with that, tools or other things are going to come with them and are going to be transferring to gateway. So the, there is a lot of communication that needs to, to happen across these different programs, not, not just uh, one. And, uh, and, and it's hard because, uh, like I said, gateway has international partners, commercial providers doing that. So we already have um, a lot of uh, interactions that, that we need to talk to. Now comes other programs, human landing, and, and each of them have different thinkings um, and, uh, and we have to be talking uh, to each other. So that, that integration comes very handy when when we talk about these, um, these issues. Uh, so we're in, uh, in, in work uh, with that. Um, um, making sure that even at the Artemis level, there is also an HSI plan and that these discussions are, are ongoing uh, across the programs. Um, may I add something, Jackie? I think this is a really interesting topic for architects and for designers for the future, because uh, of course the engineers and architects have tried that it doesn't look cluttered. The only thing is that when you plan for something, ch things change. And for example, Sayud and Mia were similar. The design was, for example, for two crew members, and then they were suddenly up to 12. You know, after 15 years, things change. And that the ISS, uh, yeah, when you look at the images, when the modules are installed, it looks really neat. But then comes the human, and that's the point. So I hope we will succeed in integrating the human with uh, work like Jackie does. The human brings the mess. Yes, we're responsible for it and hopefully we take that responsibility early on. Amara, <laughs> yes. uh, would you like to ask a question yourself? Uh -huh. Okay, no mic. I can read that question. So Mara says, for the future, when on Mars living more than a, when we have more people living on Mars, um, more than a few hundreds of people, how will the society look like? Uh, will everyone be the same as a capitalistic aspect or will they be divided into classes like upper and lower class? Yeah, very philosophical uh, question. Um, we don't know. Um, hopefully, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the diversity is needed wherever we go, whatever we do. We need different ways of thought. Uh, and, and we don't have to go into that uh, separation of upper class and lower class. Um, but uh, I don't have an answer for that. It's it's hard to really um, tell where what's going to happen for Mars. But uh, we can do our uh, provide our contribution now, right? With you know, whatever things we we're doing and, and trying to have a, a more diverse um, uh, workforce or um, uh, more accessibility to different things uh, without uh, having to differentiate where you come from or how much money you have. Um, and, and, and the political aspects that are always uh, trickling to these things, unfortunately. But you know, it's uh, a different talk. And, and Sandra is asking, what do you think <laughs> about it? I have another question. Um, what is your opinion on um, space tourism? Is this uh, something you at NASA are thinking of or working on? Or is it just like, I don't know, a one-time idea and uh, it will not make it to future projects? Yeah, um, um, right now I think we're already having a lot of uh, space tourism activities with uh, and the, the commercial companies. Um, NASA doesn't have a uh, right now, uh, we're not getting into that, but I think we've been contributing to, to opening those doors um, 
especially with SpaceX. And we had a lot of um, those contracts that they were doing to to take humans to the International Space Station, right? They they had those and we supported uh, those activities. Uh, but they learned a lot from from that process and, and the requirements that they, they will need to to have safe flights and, and, and all that. So they apply in that into their into their endeavors. Um, so I think it's the same for the other uh, companies. Uh, and uh, for NASA specifically, we don't uh, have that. Uh, so space tourism, um, we'll see. But now uh, we support it, uh, maybe not directly, but like I mentioned with, with examples, through um, empowering a lot of the other companies to uh, to do it on, on their own. And they use those lessons learned for their own businesses. Uh, thank you for your question, Karina. And also, Mara, I think it's important to ask those questions. And even if there's no answer or not one answer, especially for you as young people, um, you are really designing the future. So, very good question. Araiba, you want to, talk, to ask the question yourself? Um, yes. I was wondering, uh, what are the basic rooms, so space for humans, for human needs that a spaceship must have? Uh, uh, basic is, uh, space rooms. Um, we, we have some um, uh, some numbers. Uh, I don't have them on top of my head, but uh, the, we use some um, uh, handbooks on, on human uh, factors, uh, and design and concepts, and, and I can send you those references uh, to, for, for you to look at. Uh, and it depends on the mission too. Um, they, they might change a little bit on, on what we want to do, uh, right? If we are expecting the, the humans to stay there for a longer period of time. You are going to have to provide a little bit more, more room. Uh, but if it's uh, for less time, then they, they can adapt to, to smaller places. So uh, it changes for uh, the, the number of, of days and that, that the crew is going to be in space. Thank you. And I want to go back to, to Karina's um, question to uh, on space tourism. Um, uh, what I said was uh, about NASA. Now, uh, uh, as Jackie, <laughs> what I uh, think is um, uh, we need that, right? We need the opportunity for the, the normal public like us that, and that can go and, 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 and visit a space one way or another. Uh, so hopefully with the efforts that, uh, that are happening, um, whether it's uh, government or private, uh, that we, we have a chance to go uh, to space and and that it goes is just like the, uh, the aircraft or airplane affairs that were very um, high price at the beginning, but then eventually we all uh, have access to to go to those uh, flights that um, for space uh, hopefully becomes that way too. Uh, soon, hopefully, I, uh, if we can be part of that, that will be even better. So uh, the government is uh, against it right now? I don't know. I wouldn't say against it. It's just uh, it's not part of the of the things that uh, we do. It uh, for NASA it is more of like oh, what are the things that um, the call the commercial sector cannot do, right? That that is not a, a, a cause that doesn't bring cost and benefit because the the commercial sector can is gonna look to to make money, and space tourism will give them that. Um, so in our case for NASA, we're not in the business of making money, but of encountering and solving problems that cannot be done by, by other people or other companies because it's not going to give them money. Um, so the, the, the view is a little bit different from, uh, from the government perspective. Thank you. And also, will there be some sort of testing stations for people who can go there and test? Like, because I cannot really imagine how it will be in space, but I guess it will it will be nice to get the feeling first and then to decide, OK, I will want to see it or not, or is it something for me or not? 
So right. would, there, would there be some sort of testing station first? Because for astronauts, there is something like this, like this right? Mm -hmm. Right, where they can train. Yeah, I heard some um, ideas that they are already coming up with, even for the space camps, right? For uh, high school students, they, they should open it to adults. <laughs> uh, they uh, where you can go and do some of the the training that astronauts do, and um, I think in Canada they already have a academy where you can do that. Um, I don't uh, remember the name. Um, but uh, in the space ports, um, they're planning to use that also as a business model, right? Uh, again, the, the commercial aspect, you know, they, they want to make some money, but um, to be able to train the general public to to go for those flights. And if there are not, maybe that's, that's an area where we can, uh, you know, invest and maybe develop that for, for others to use. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good idea. Have a few questions in the class or Aralba? I I did answer your question. Yeah, it will be interesting. Who who will be the first people on the moon? Huh? I mean the first the next first people is also an interesting question. Nicholas, you think it will be NASA scientists? Yeah, I think it would be logical because they have to break new ground. They have to be familiar with the um, um, data and they have to be able to fix the station, etc. So it would be likely that it would be NASA scientists and en engineers to break new ground for others to come afterwards. And I think economics can only be at play if there is like competition going on. So if there would be different kind of colonies with different opportunities or goals, then it could be possible that these have um, some kind of new system of operating um, economically or um, with or against each other. So at first, I don't think that any kind of economic you know, play makes sense because everybody has to share the uh, own goal um, because they want to survive and live well there. And they are all inside the same kind of space. So. Um, they're really close, like, I, it's maybe a, a strange comparison, but I would like to compare it to like cavemen or something like that, because you're basically forced to live together and you don't have any kind of somebody else to interact with. And so um, playing against each other at the beginning, I don't think that would make any kind of sense. Mara, please, familiar me. Uh, well, it seems that uh, there were no women on the moon of yet. And, uh, and uh, as you look at, uh, at the people at NASA who are recruiting the new people who would go to, to the moon, uh, there's some more or better representation of, of us. And maybe that's also a good first step. Yes, and, and actually for um, uh, the Artemis mission uh, that I was um, mentioning earlier, let's see if I can uh, picture. Yeah, the uh, Artemis uh, is the, the umbrella, right? We have many programs that are under that. and. Um, the the idea is to send the first uh, woman there to uh, in person of color to to the moon. And so that, that should be uh, exciting uh, to to see um, women represented there too. Okay, the next question, Cheki. When we design for women and men, do you make any difference? in human systems integration? Uh, currently, no. The, the way it's done is they look at the 5%, um, the, uh, the lowest uh, percentile, so the, from the smallest uh, person, which includes the women typically, 
and, and the the, uh, the largest. So it's five percent to ninety five percent percentile of um, of height and and, and size. Uh, and then all the tests uh, that are done uh, have to be accounted for for both uh, the types. So in, in, in that way, we ensure that people from different um, ethnicities and body shapes and uh, in, uh, in, um, in gender are included in, in that frame. So then that's how it's done. And, and that's part of the requirements too. There are tables of anthropometry that uh, it says that these are the, the length and the range that hey, your spacecraft or, or your module will have to, to meet uh, to be able to accommodate all these range of, of people. And we're all different, right? So we'll, we'll be hard to just uh, assign something for, for each. Um, the, the spacesuits are also they do have for women uh, and, and men, uh, but it's also within that range. Um, it could be done better. Uh, I think we, we heard all those news that a, a woman couldn't go to uh, to a space walk because they didn't have enough of those in the International Space Station. So that's also something that wasn't thought of uh, early on. Um, but um, now in, th those are getting better, right? There's even uh, now... Um, an EVA specific uh, program uh, and along with the rovers that is going to be uh, handling all that. And, and that's being outsourced now. So commercial companies get to provide their uh, uh, their options and so their design options and, and hopefully they account for these, right? Like you know, we have women's size and, uh, and accounting for different things that we might need that men might, uh, might don't need, right? Um, uh, like the padding right now, they add a lot of padding in the sides or, or the front and, and the back. Uh, and sometimes we need more of that support than, than men would do. So uh, that's important to, to take into account too. Yeah. Good question. Vincent, just uh, turn your mic on. Yeah, hello. Thank you, first of all. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about the Chinese orbit station, the planned orbit station here near? Do you think it's all about power, um, like nationally, or is it is it like good for everybody because we can gather competition? I, I think it's good. Anything that we can do to contribute to advance our um, technology, right? By anyone who who enters into space, um, yeah business or space uh, um, activities, uh, we gain so much from that that we can bring back to Earth. And there's a lot of benefits to uh, to developing technology for space. Uh, it makes us think outside the box and, and things that we never thought that it could be done. Uh, and now that we use them every day, right? And GPS was developed to, to help track these satellites that were out in space and we didn't know what was gonna happen with them. But now we're using our everyday lives and, and not just the military that I was working in the study, but and, and us as citizens, we can, we can use it. Um, so uh, in, in any country that enters into that, like uh, with uh, our station that, that you mentioned, is great. And if they can bring back those, um, uh, those the, the things that they're learning and, uh, and, and share with others that, that helps it uh, even uh, to expand even more right, our, our knowledge. And, and competition is is good. Um, and I, I I don't see it that much as, as competition, but also as collaboration, uh, right? And we need that that little push to always be be better to find out you know, other ways to do things. Um, and uh, if competition is what is needed, then, uh, then it's welcome. Uh, as long as there is, it doesn't uh, surpass to those parts of, um, of being enemies or, or getting to wars and, and all that. Uh, uh, safe and um, competition is good to, to get our minds thinking and come up with different ideas of how to do things. Thank you. Um, maybe this would also be a good point 
Jackie, can you talk a bit about the new space enterprises? Because when we talk about, you know, ISS and uh, previous missions, it was more or less restricted to specific organizations related to some states, nations. And we are seeing a big uh, evolution in companies, right? I mean, I have the feeling every week we have new companies that want to be part of it. And uh, you have, uh, maybe you can say a little bit that NASA is now cooperating with those private companies a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, the new space and uh, and also uh, it goes into the space divide um, that, um, that we've been talking about. So um, it's, it's not new to, to NASA to work with in commercial companies. Uh, we've been using a lot of them to develop a lot of our uh, our things that are on Mars and, and in space, right? Um, big companies, that, the names you you know, Boeing and Lockheed Martin uh, primarily. Um, but uh, in that case, NASA was doing a lot of the, these are the requirements, this is how you're gonna do it, and, and they just develop it and, and deliver it. Uh, and now it's more of these are the requirements you figure out they have, but they come back to us asking like, oh, is this correct? Uh, do you have examples? How have you done it before? Uh, so that guidance is still there, uh, but it also allows for that flexibility and uh, innovative ways for uh, different companies to, to do that. Um, a lot of the, um, the requests for proposals that we put out uh, ask them also to, to collaborate with other companies. So it's not just one proposal by one company because that, you know, it's just, it just goes to, to one place like it was done in the past. But now you see the collaboration of different um, companies that are getting together to, to provide the best of their capabilities, right? One might provide the power, another one the, the markup, another one the same module or the same. Uh, however, they, they, they want to do it, but they also are collaborating and NASA gives the, the, the money to, to one contract, but then they are able to distribute to, to different companies and their employees also get trained on that. There's more expertise all across and, and that fosters also <clears throat> the, uh, the interest of a lot of students and, and young professionals that are trying to to build and develop these new systems. And there's a lot of great ideas uh, to, to do this. So uh, the new space has been uh, able to, to do that. And we're happy to contribute to that, right? Being, being that leading force where they can come and, and still ask questions. Uh, we still want to be the, the hub of, uh, you know, we've done it before. We don't want to keep doing everything because uh, obviously there's a lot more people that, that can do this. Uh, but we're here if you need us and uh, for for support, for guidance, for funding, <laughs> right? Uh, a lot of them you know, still come from that. Um, and, and that has allowed that. Um, and, and the part for um, the space divide uh, is, uh, it, it was touched on the International Astronautical Federation along with the United Nations lately uh, of uh, new countries are coming into the space um, uh, sector as well. And, and we want to be able to open that uh, that room for for a lot more people to to participate. They don't have to come with a whole rover to to provide, right, or uh, or a module for that, but something that they can contribute to. Uh, in this case, the Artemis uh, mission, but it could be something else. Um, and there is the Artemis Accords that a lot of countries have been interested in participating that they've been signing. Uh, and uh, the collaborations can go from like providing project management ideas to uh, to actual hardware or software. So anything that you want to contribute with, uh, right, that's uh, that's the collaboration that, that we've been talking about. Um, and, and I hope you, you guys are also thinking of that, how you can collaborate from your university or from um, uh, maybe later on through a, through a project, uh, through a mock-up. Um, I always say like we have to start small, right? We cannot go and try to do a launcher and uh, and, and have that out there. It's like step by step, what can we contribute with? 
uh, and, uh, and then we expand more. We learn that and then we expand even more. Uh, interesting times come, coming up and uh, it, it's good to know that there's that interest and a lot of um, great ideas uh, out there that are um, happening either through existing contracts and, and, or through coming up with their own companies and their own ideas. A lot of people are opening their own um, companies too to, to support uh, even as graphic designers right, or um, space news, um, the, the spaces for everyone. Um, does it have to be just from uh, from the habitat side or or that, but um, it depends on where your heart is and still um, contributing to space. Um, we have a more personal question because this seems to be a really big part of your life and we're wondering if you have already been into space and if not, if you would like to go and be there for your, like be there for yourself. Yes, thanks, Eva uh, and Katie. Um, no, I haven't been to space yet. Well, we, we live in space, right? We all are in this spaceship of Earth, but um, I, I know you mean uh, outside of Earth. Um, that, that's one of the goals. Um, the, the astronaut calls are not coming as frequent as uh, as I would have hoped um, nowadays. It's like every four years or so. Uh, but um, uh, we'll see if there's an opportunity that that, that would be great. Um, but I'm happy to contribute to getting us there, right? And my son definitely doesn't want me to go. <laughs> uh, he's nine years old and he says, no, do anything you want, but don't go to space. Because <laughs> of all the risks that, that happen in, uh, in that. But um, I also tell him, hey, we have risks even when we get up from bed, right? We, I can turn bad and, and from the bed and, and fall down. We, we never know. Uh, but we need to, to to know how to take those um on those specific risks um measure risks. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's still a goal. Uh, I mean, there I did some analog studies and and uh, that help a lot to understand it from their view, right? What well, what do you do when you're isolated from from everyone else and and you have limited resources and you are in a very constrained space? Uh, it's it's tough. And stuff <laughs> uh, but um the, we we prepare uh, for that with with the different designs that we do and, and hopefully my contribution through the requirements through doing that human, human systems integration can help uh, people efficiently perform when they are uh, doing their um, their activities in the space thank, thank you. you so i have a more general question question so i was wondering where do you see the main task of architects in the next few years in space flight? Is it like conducting analog studies? Is it the design of specific parts in space stations or space habitats? Or is it even like um, yeah, controlling different fields? Or where do you see the tasks of architects in the next few, year, next few years? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we need uh, the, that type of thinking all, all over, right? And, and it depends on what you like to do. If you're more hands-on, you might want to be doing those designs, right, in, in 3D programs. Or um, if you want to do more testing in the markups in, my, the, in that area. Um, uh, but it, it could be for testing and assembly. And also to make the, the big decisions at, at the higher level right, of, of architecture. You're not touching hardware or software, um, uh, but maybe having those conversations with the crew members and uh, and helping other program managers to make the decisions. And architects can can be those program managers too, right? Uh, at some point, integrating everyone into uh, into one one phase of uh, of, of ideas. Um, uh, right now, um, the there's no specific, uh, the companies are still growing, like I said, with uh, space architecture, but uh, a lot of those positions are within uh, either human factors or uh, systems engineering. And we need that kind of thinking, right, of uh, applying requirements into uh, into the, the full spectrum. And uh, the, the architecture allows for that. So you have room in, in different phases to where, where you want to be and uh, as we, they are understanding more than they need for, for architects and uh, you can contribute in any phase that, that you like the most. Thank you. Uh, Maha, 
Was the question only for me, or you want to ask it to everyone? Okay. So I know that Jackie has to leave in now, in a few minutes, right? Yes, and I want to end with just a um, uh, recap of, of what we touched on. Um, this part, just uh, the review of HSI concepts. Uh, so we touched on what is HSI, uh, interdisciplinary technical and management process. Uh, so remember that and that we're integrating human considerations, uh, both the limitations and capabilities. Uh, we're looking at this system of systems, all right, where the human is always part of that system. Uh, with the hardware and software in a given environment and, and the six HSI domains that, that we touched on. Um, and this expertise can be in different places. They can be called differently depending on, on, on what company you're, you're with or how you're treating it, but uh, the, the main uh, expertise or, or disciplines um, ideas are, are there. Uh, so with that, I have some references too, if you wanna uh, take a look. Um, I do have that. Um, I'll give that the reference to to Sandra uh, for the question on the uh, that I was asked earlier on the references. But uh, I'll send you that Sandra for you to share with them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have one question. Okay, two maybe. No, Mara. Mara, now it's your turn. Okay, we cannot hear you. Your mic is off. Okay, um, I don't know if you can hear me properly, but the microphone is not working that good. And my question was that the NASA can learn about the colonization of the um, Europe, or the, of uh, South and North America and what they can do better for the colonization of Mars and Moon. Yeah, I didn't hear the full question. Um, have you understood, Cheke? Uh, he was asking, Maria was asking, what NASA can learn or should learn from the early colonization of the European uh, colonization of North and South America. So I think he speaks really about your cultural background. What do you think you can contribute or what NASA should learn from you? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, coming from, from Peru, uh, we say more, and the, the way that uh, they taught us history was like the bad guys came and took all our culture, right? <laughs> and, and our products and, and people. So I don't know if, if that's a good uh, good example, but uh, that's why the colonization war is, is not as uh, appealing to me. Uh, it's more of like, what do we go to a certain place, in this case, Mars, right? Uh, your question, and, and we see what's there. Uh, and we learn and we adapt and, and, and not, not with the uh, eagerness to go and, uh, and put our things there, right? And um, just uh, tell everyone we have to do different things. Uh, so there, I know there's talks about uh, terraforming and, and, and all that. There's a lot of different ideas, but um, I think that what we can learn more from that is uh, how there, from coming from Latin America, um, uh, our uh, culture and the way we do is we have to survive with a lot with little, right? Um, we don't have all the resources that the, the big countries had. And now I'm in the U.S., but a, a lot of the the things that are taken for granted here well, I didn't have when I was growing up, and we had to to make it work with what we had, um, it can be resources or references or anything, and. And, and that idea helps because when we are in a different planet, you're not going to go and buy something to, to the store, right? You have to make it work with what you have. Um, so I, I think that's what uh, we bring from, from that perspective of 
making it work with you know, with uh, the things that we have and being very curious and very innovative and coming up with different ideas that probably people are not thinking of because they already have it uh, to, to their hands, right? It's handed on to them. Uh, so we come up with, with those uh, uh, different sometimes. It's like, how do you even create that uh, that fan, for example, right? And, and it's made out of um, uh, materials that you might not think of. So that um, thinking out of the box I think is what uh, what we bring with um, uh, to to apply to the different things that, that we do. And, and is that a good way to uh, to close, Mara? Because uh, that invites also to to show that we need a diverse uh, workforce, to diverse people, to um, and not just ethnicity and where we come from, but our uh, our education. Uh, of the different fields that that we are experts on, uh, that's what we need to bring to to the space sector. Um, you, you cannot just do things with engineers that that will fail, <laughs> right? We need architects. We need uh, um, like uh, the public affairs and uh, administrators, uh, everyone, the different disciplines to to make our mission successful. Jackie, thank, thank you very much. I think this was a beautiful, wonderful grand conclusion and uh, outlook also to the future that we are all part of and uh, the students are the ones that will create our future. So I uh, thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you for taking the time and have a good day. Yeah, thank you all for your questions and uh, good luck with all your, uh, uh, Thanks your for projects. Thanks for opening thank the camera. Yes, it's nice to see your faces. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you.